You are watching KUTV Primetime News with Mutegi K. Martin. Welcome back and for those who just tuned in, you're watching KUTV Primetime News and tonight we are also live on Facebook at KUTV Kenya. Now, 1,700 youth have urged the government to recommit regionally to comprehensive sexuality education. They continue to sign the petition targeting 2,500 youth for inclusion of more on education and access for information and services for adolescents with the ongoing conversations on competency-based curriculum, CBC. According to the young people, the pandemic has seen the increase of teenage pregnancies, sexual violence, and consequently prevalence in HIV, negating the efforts to reduce adverse effects of unprotected sex and safeguarding the young people from early pregnancies and further spread of sexually transmitted diseases. According to research, at least one in five young women in six countries in the eastern and southern African region have started childbearing by the age of just 17 years. Also today, HIV remains an urgent problem with 430,000 new infections per year among young people aged 15 to 24, with young women still more heavily affected and with an increase of 50% in deaths amongst adolescents living with HIV globally. Other issues such as gender-based violence and forced early marriages among girls and young women continue to affect the young people in the continent. The Youth Changes Kenya, YCK, Zamara Foundation and Youth Empowerment Movement and 20 other organizations as well will be running a two-month campaign seeking to petition the government to recommit to the Eastern and Southern Africa ESA Commitment on Comprehensive Sexuality Education, CSE. As Kenya speaks on issues of CBC, investment in quality education that includes comprehensive life skills-based sexuality education fulfills the right to education while also contributing to the well-being and future. Quality of life is also key in this discussion. We're now joined by Josephine Cheng, Program Assistant and at Youth Changes Kenya to bring us to speed with this development. Karibu sana Josephine if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Uh, and borrowing from uh, the, the recent past and a few years back, we have been talking about sex education. But now you people are addressing something that goes by the name comprehensive sexuality education. Is it the same thing? Is it a new term to include other topics in this particular education? Um, thank you so much. Um, Comprehensive sexuality education is not a new term. Um, it's a term that has been there for the longest time since uh, the commitment, the ESA commitment that you mentioned was signed in 2015. Um, in 2013, I mean, so the term has been there for a while. And um, the reason we shifted from sexuality, uh, sex education to comprehensive sexuality education is because when we talk about sex education, the first thing that comes to people's mind are sex we are only talking about sex and that is not the message we are trying to put across um we i, I acknowledge the fact that uh, the current curriculum the cbc curriculum has some, some aspects of sexual education in terms of um hygiene and, and and just uh good and bad touch for pp1 all the way to grade three which is very commendable but then that one is not enough so when you talk about comprehensive sexual education we are thinking about issues of decision making, equipping young people with the skills to be able to make informed choices, healthy relationships, HIV, consent, contraceptive, sexuality, hygiene. So comprehensive sexuality education covers different topics. And the good thing with it is that when we talk about comprehensive, it means um, it, the information is tailored according to the age of that person. For example, if we are speaking to a three year, three year old, five year old, for example, who teach them about you know good touch and bad touch if somebody touches you here it is bad uh they just mentioning those parts as they are as opposed to telling them um if somebody like she, she can do you know when you tell a child to do it's it, 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 that's not the actual name of the thing so it's just us just trying to tell people that um comprehensive sexual education encompasses a whole lot of things it's not only about sex so it's not a new term it's a term that has been there for a long time 
All right, and as we talk about comprehensive sexuality education and the agreement between the ESA states, um, and of course uh, you people pushing for the government to recommit to that agreement, what was the initial agreement that Kenya, uh, together with other African states, got into? And how are they supposed to recommit to this particular agreement? And also, as you answer that, how are other African states also handling the same? Have they renewed their commitment to the same? Or are we facing just a Kenyan problem? Um, thank you. Uh, I cannot necessarily speak for other countries because I cannot hold them accountable. But currently, I can only hold my government accountable. So I'll speak to Kenya in the context of Kenya. So when, when, when these countries signed, when these 20 countries signed this commitment, there were some uh, things that they were supposed to achieve by 2015 and 2020. So by 2015, what was expected that the Kenyan government included to have done was to develop a, a quality comprehensive sexuality education framework and for it to be in place and being implemented in schools. And then the other thing was to, by the end of 2015, decrease the decrease by 50% the number of adolescents and young people who do not have access to youth friendly services. So that was the, that is what they were supposed to have done by 2015. But now we're in 2020 and uh, the, the commitments are sort of like expired. And by now, we are, they are expected to have one, um, have the curriculum in place, eliminate sexual gender-based violence, eliminate teenage pregnancies, uh, eliminate new HIV infections among its young people, which unfortunately has not been done because um, we've seen in the news that teenage pregnancy is still a minute. And I, I want to congratulate the government for you know setting up a task force to address the issue of teenage pregnancy. That is a step in the right direction. And then based on a, re a, re a report that was done by UNESCO in 2018, it shows that we've, little has been done. Um, and and, and we, we, yes, we've made a few progress here, but then there's more, there's more that needs to be done. And by the Kenyan government recommitting to this uh, commitment, it just shows that they care for the health and well-being of the young people in their country. And they are very passionate about just eliminating teenage pregnancy, which is a discussion that we've been having for the longest time, eliminating gender-based violence in our country. So the commitment, them recommitting to it, just shows that they have that goodwill and they have the well-being of young people at heart. So yeah, that's why we are calling on to them, sort of like commit to this, to really commit to the commitment, because if they had not met this, this, uh, this requirement, then recommitting gives recommitting give them an opportunity to sort of like achieve these things that they had not achieved prior. All right, as we continue to talk about comprehensive sexual uh, sexuality education, uh, of key is the issue of HIV AIDS, and already you have mentioned, uh, you've already mentioned HIV as one of the issues that are revolve around this sexuality education. Uh, how would you rate yeah. the prevalence of HIV maybe in the 90s and the early 2000s as compared to the times that we are living right now? Um, we've made progress, I must say, and that is something I'm very proud to say. We've made progress, however small, but we, we are moving, we've made progress. And this progress can be seen in terms of the number of people that are getting tested now, there are numbers of awareness, um, campaigns that have been carried out, chasing points, the Chukwa selfie campaign, which was aimed at just uh, encouraging people to go get tested and to know their status. In as much as yes, all these are being done, there's one group that has been left out, so to speak, um, in terms of when you look at the statistics currently, uh, then the young women and girls are the ones contributing to the new HIV infections in our current country currently. So if you look at the data, it will show that for young people, adolescents and young people, there's, there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a problem and there's a lot that needs to be done. And we can allude this to the fact that we've recently seen um, the issue of drug shortage. There's, there are no drugs, there are no test kits. And, and, and just this contributes to that because if I'm a young person living with HIV, for instance, mm. and I don't have my medication, then definitely my adherence will be affected. If my adherence is affected, then I'll start getting sick. If I start getting sick, then I'll probably die. And then that sort of like increases the mortality rate uh, of AIDS-related death as opposed to, um, you know, if if drugs were there and, 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 if, and if things were done the way they're supposed to be done. So I think, yes, we've made strides, um, a bit of strides, but I think more still needs to be done. A lot of work, a lot of interventions still need to be done 
advocate are for this particular group of young people between the age of 10 to 24 because this is where the, the gap is this is where the new age living sectors are coming from all right it is, it is however key to note that um uh, with us fighting the virus by the name hiv another virus came and took over covid 19 and most of our focus was shifted to the covid 19 and definitely we have lost focus uh, our focus on hiv and other stis that have continued to uh, you know affect a number of people uh, how does covid 19 and the and, and the coming of the same and you know the fact that the covid 19 is still here, here with us how is it affecting how we manage and control uh, hiv and other stis i think when covid hit it all caught us by surprise i must say and there was a lot of misinformation in terms of how it is spread you should have been avoiding facilities and because of all those um all those uh, rumors going around, people were very scared to go to the facility. For example, people living with HIV were very scared to go to the facility because people are saying if you go to the facilities, you will contract it. So they didn't go to facilities, and if they don't go to facilities, they didn't get their medication on time. And they, if they don't take their medication, then their adherence is affected, and then they start getting sick. So there's that aspect of guys were scared to go to the facility, which in turn affected how they would take their medication. That's one. Two, um, COVID has also brought about itself with issues of mental health um, because, uh, like I said, it came by a surprise. Uh, nobody knows what will happen tomorrow. People are dying. Um, there are new diagnoses every day. And it was just a very scary time, and it still is. So it sort of like also affected um, the mental health and well-being of young people. The people are having a lot of anxiety going on. People are battling depression. So there is that bit, and then now there's the aspect of the vaccine that has come. With the vaccine, it has it also its fair share of um, myths and misconceptions. And the fact that it is there, the concern that people living with HIV now have are, especially young people are, if I take this vaccine, how will it interact with my medication? You know, how will it, will it, may, will it make my medication work or will it not make my medication work? So these are some of the questions that young people are asking themselves. And unless we give out the right information in terms of how COVID and, and, and how HIV are, we will still be fighting the same, same things. And the fact that the government has put a lot of effort on COVID, which I understand is, is good progress, but then they should not forget about these other epidemics that we have that is HIV and AIDS. I think they need to work together so that five, 10 years from now, we don't look back, we've started COVID, but then now we have to come back and again start touching the issue of HIV. It means they need to put efforts on both fronts all right and as we continue to talk about COVID 19 and its effects we notice that the effects are not just um they're not just uh in the medical field but also psychological issues of mental health as you have said and economic uh, uh state as well of many kenyans has been affected and uh, just to note that uh, some of the kenyans are facing depression because of their economic instability and some of the other things that come with it is poverty and of course people not going to jobs anymore people not having stable businesses and therefore lacking uh you know their sources of livelihoods and poverty has over the years been linked to one of the factors that can lead to the spread of hiv and aids now uh, we're looking at uh, an impending danger that is about to come by the hike in the amount of uh, and in the numbers of people who are affected by covid uh, by hiv i beg your pardon how is this in your view going to affect the situation in the country and are people gonna get hiv because um you see in the situations where we have uh, uh girls and young women who may opt to uh, go to uh, places like in the industries like prostitution which uh, have been linked also to poverty and how is this going to affect this the country in this particular time um i think with, with, with poverty has like you mentioned like it has its own fair share of issues and i think um it, it, ha it will if, if unless we address it now we'll be asking ourselves um questions of what went wrong what did we do right because at the moment for example my family we cannot be able to feed ourselves and then there's just been here yeah, who i'm the sanitary towel what way do i will engage in transactional sex to be able to 
get those basic needs um, that, I may, that I may want. Um, and then when you look at that, uh, most of these young women that are engaging in transactional sex, most of them don't have the bargaining power. The power is not on them. They don't get to decide whether they use a condom or not. The power lies with the person that is giving them money. So imagine if all those, all the, all the young women who are not um, financially able to, you know, get the basic needs that they want, engage into tra transactional sex, then most definitely will have an increase in the rate of HIV and STI infection. And then also poverty has also been, um, has also contributed to the fact that we have a lot of GBV cases happening, a lot of STV cases happening. And it's so sad to see that. And if unless so, all these issues that we're talking about, most of them are related to poverty. So unless we address the issue of poverty, trust me, three, five years down the line, we will be having a very big problem in terms of the new STIs and HIV infections among these young people. Right. And as we conclude, and uh, now gender-based violence and forced early marriages have also kept coming up as we continue to fight other things, including the pandemic that we have right now. How is this comprehensive sexuality education going to address these particular factors and help the young people build better futures? Um, so when uh, the topic that I mentioned earlier in terms of that are covered under comprehensive sexuality education, there is a bit on gender um, because a lot of gender violence cases are attributed to, you know, what the society thinks um, is, is, is appropriate or not. And, and, and just um, so complete sexuality education teaches young people on gender, gender roles, dismantling patriarchy, putting women and girls at the same level as men, and not propagating this notion of men are superior and all those things. I think that's the main cause of GBV that we have in, in our country. So, uh, so um, um, the complete sexuality education will provide these young people with this information. Um, they'll, they'll be able to, you know, know that it's okay for for example men to go to the kitchen it's okay for as a man to do your own laundry um if it's okay for a girl to say no and mean no as opposed to what we know right now if a girl says no then she probably means yes no csc teaches men to respect that when a woman says no she means no um it also teaches um the people to know uh in terms of power how do you balance power and how do you not use your power to be able to infringe on the on the other person's rights and it also shares information in terms of in case you've experienced violence that is what do you need to do um do you know it in terms of the referral pathways of the procedure that you need to go through to be able to you know prevent uh, you from contracting HIV or a pregnancy that you, that, that they may come across from that. So it's it's it, it, it's a holistic um, sort of like curriculum that provides all these things, and all these things uh, shape how a young person thinks, shapes how how they how they view women, shapes how they interact with other people. So. CSC will provide all these things, and most importantly, that I'm very happy about, which is this much of patriarchy. Thank you. All right. Uh, lastly, before I let you go, as we as we have been talking about CSC, uh, two ministries come to mind: the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education. Um, how are these two ministries individually responsible for what is happening, and how can they make things better? And also, can the two ministries also collaborate to make sure that there is effective CSE in the country? And also, as you answer that, also talk about um, the teachers as well. Because as you began, you talked about classification of information. Of course, there is a information that is sensitive to three-year-olds that 16-year-olds need to know that classification and where teachers need to be enlightened. Do we, have, do we need a special training for teachers in the first place? Um, so I think the aim of the two ministries is to develop policies and frameworks. And when they are doing this, I think it would be very important for them to involve the young people themselves um, and other relevant stakeholders. Because if you are going to develop, for example, the curriculum that we are asking for, you cannot develop um, the curriculum without involving the people that are supposed to benefit from the curriculum. So meaningful involvement of young people when it comes to policy development uh, by the means of us and community of education is very, very important. Um, the other thing is for them to prioritize the sexual reproductive rights and rights of young people and, and, and just 
we've seen them prioritize it by, you know, that, that the task that was come to engineer pregnancy. But then prioritizing without funding does not really equal to full implementation. So even as they prioritize and as they show that they are very concerned with the health and well-being of young people, they need to translate that with resources. And then the other thing is um, their, their role is to provide um, information and services, information that is from the Ministry of Education bit, and then services from the Ministry of Health. And all this needs to be done without any form of discrimination um, from anyone. Um, and then the other thing I would say is Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, CSOs and other partners, I think they need to work together. We are all doing amazing things that are you know, meant for the better for the better health of young people, but then we are doing them in, in, in silos. We are all working on our own, and I think it's high time that we all come to the same table and speak with the same voice because we are all after the same thing. Um, in terms of teachers, based on the, because I've been to a couple of schools conducting sessions, and based on the teachers we've interacted with, none of them have been trained, unfortunately. And it's so sad that um, teachers are the ones that spend most of the time with, their, with, 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 with the students as opposed to our parents, and that's just the reality of things. And if, since I spend a lot of time with my teacher, there are certain things I'll definitely ask my teacher, not my parents. So I think teachers need to be trained on how to provide this information. And based on the curriculum that I had mentioned that reviewed, um, you'd find a, a, a mathematics teacher or a science teacher is still expected to teach, to teach CSC, which is which is very overwhelming for, for this teacher. So if the teachers that are going to be trained on CAC, they need to specifically be on CAC and not other subjects. The fact that they have other subjects, that's where when I was in school would have instances of, during the time we were supposed to be taught life skills, we are being taught Swahili or we are being taught mathematics. They overlook that aspect of it. Um, and then also another thing that is very important is for us to just bring different people on board. On board. I know when you're talking about Comprehensive sexuality education really just need us sort of like I'm not comfortable with that conversation mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of misinformation about it. But I would like to echo that Youth Changes Kenya has worked closely with the religious leaders, and yes, we have religious leaders who are very comfortable to speak about issues of sexuality and are comfortable to ensure that young people are doing better in their own lives and they are healthy and they are working towards achieving their dreams. All right, thank you so much, Josephine Cheng, for joining us tonight for that comprehensive talk on comprehensive sexuality education. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. All right, there you have it, comprehensive sexuality education with Josephine Acheng of the Youth Changes Kenya. There, telling us on what we need to do in collaboration with the government and all of us and the stakeholders. You're a stakeholder together with the government and other organizations. With that, we take a short break. We'll be right back with more. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>